are your ways, great are your works. Great are your you all can go to their class. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have this great Christian principle of great grace. In John chapter 1, verse 15, says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This it was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, but he was before me. And of his fullness have we all, or have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 to 33. It says, when, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to spake, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. I thank God for Glory. grace that is divine yes. power and it causes our hearts to rejoice. Yes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Yes. Rejoice this is the day that the Lord hath made. Glory. Oh, hallelujah. I will rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Oh, hallelujah. We rejoice in the Lord because of the grace, the bountiful grace of our God that he has shed to us. In Jesus' name, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Thank you, Lord for the power of the Holy Ghost. And thank you for the, your power and the strength tonight. And thank you, Lord, for your great grace that you have shown and given to your people, to your church. And we just give you praise in that awesome and mighty name. Oh, hallelujah. And everyone shout out in Jesus' name. Come on, shout it out in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Yo, we are saved by grace. Yes. The Magruders years ago sang the song, and I believe uh, he wrote it. Saved by grace. I've been saved by grace. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm going to really blunder it. Uh, it's not about I'm not what I used to be, but I'm saved by grace. I have to have Matthew edit that part out. But uh, we have been saved by grace. Your grace does not save us apart from the faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, salvation is something that we can earn, is not something that we can earn by our faith. Because if it was something that, we could, that could be earned, then you see that God's grace, the unmerited favor, would now be dependent upon uh, man's ability or inability to believe, making salvation dependent on humanity and thus impossible. So we see that salvation is not something that we earn but it is a gift it is something that was given to every individual that is willing to accept it right. hallelujah Thank who you. are willing to bow a knee and cry out to Jesus 
Save me a sinner. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, the grace of God precedes human faith. The act of God makes it possible for all to have enough faith to respond to God in a positive way. Salvation is somewhat like a boomerang. And I've tried to operate one of those things. It's so unlike a uh, Frisbee, because you take a Frisbee, the round disc, and you throw it, and you expect it not to come back to you. But individuals, and I've watched some that kind of sort of mastered it. You know, it's kind of a, a it's almost a 90 degree angled piece of wood or piece of plastic. And it is shaped in such a way that you're able to toss it out and it should come back to you to catch it. Now I've seen those who have mastered it and made it so easy because they're selling the product. And it's like, surely there's a trick. Where's that piece of elastic? It must be a long one. But you know, they stand there and it's like for Seven bucks, you can have this thing. Look how much fun you have. And throws it, and, and it goes up there and does tricks, and he comes back, and he catches it, and he throws it again. And I tried throwing one and get caught in a tree somewhere. Or I'd have to go chase after it. It's like, that's no fun. But when you think about how the operation of the boomerang, as it goes out, it comes back. Salvation is somewhat like that. God initiated the plan through the incarnation and his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Uh, when mankind could not get to God, what did God do? He came to where man was. When man could not get good enough to get God, God laid aside his robe, picked up a fleshly robe so, so that he could show that man could become not good to get God, but he could receive God's spirit. You know, when people say, well, when I get good, I'll get God. When I get good, I'll get in the church. When I get, I'm sorry, if you wait till you get good enough, you will never be good enough. But I'm so thankful for grace that's been extended to us. And since faith is a prerequisite for salvation, this initial work of grace makes it possible, oh hallelujah, for us to reach out in faith and touch or receive God. The scriptures describe the measure of faith that God gives to every one. You know, people say, oh, if I could only have the faith of Sister Joyce, or if I could have the faith of Brother Talbot, if I could only have the faith of uh, Brother Billy Cole, if I could, I'm sorry. <coughs> Everyone has been given a measure of faith. But it's what you do with the measure of faith. You know, I could give everyone a packet of seed corn and it's dependent upon you and your faith in what you do with that seed corn. Mm -hmm. Now, you, some <laughs> will take it and they'll rejoice. Look what I have. I have a packet of seed corn. And for the next 20 years, they're still holding on that packet of seed corn. Look what I have. But guess what? Others over the past 20 years have, took, have taken that packet of seed corn. They planted it and reaped not just a packet, but maybe a bushel of seed corn. They take that and plant it and they reap more. Yet everyone started out with the same packet of corn. When God has imparted to every man, woman, child, the same measure of faith. And yet some say, well, you know, if I could just believe that God died for someone like me, I might give my life to him. But I just can't believe it. You know, if I could 
understand and, and believe that, that God died for a terrible sinner like me. But yet, the Word says that every person has a measure of faith that was given to them. But why some receive and some don't is the difference of taking the corn and planting it or just taking it and waving it around for the next 20 years. See what I have? And then you could stop and compare what you have and what they have. Well, I could never be good enough to be like them. Guess what? They started out just like you, That's right. just like me. Uh, we see that the power of grace enables all mankind to have adequate faith to accept God's plan of redemption. The boomerang effect is our using the faith. He has given us to respond to him. This activating his grace in our lives. You know, some people have referred to this faith as obedient faith or saving faith. See, using this packet of seed corn, some people, you know, the instruction says exactly how to plant the seed corn. You know, uh, so many kernels of corn, so many inches apart, and, uh, you know, you go through the process if you want good corn. And some people say, oh, it doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, they don't even bother about tilling the ground. They just throw their corn out. And then they complain, well, I didn't get a harvest. Did you follow the direction? See, part of our faith is, are we living in obedience to the word of God? Are we living in obedience to the faith that he's planted within us? It is important for us to note that the devil also believes in God. But because he believes in God doesn't mean he's going to be saved. You know, James, you know, in his writing of, uh, I think it's 218, he says that the uh, devils believe and they tremble. If only some of us would believe and tremble. <laughs> but the devils believe they tremble. But they're not going to be saved. Uh, God's faith condemns him. But our response to God in faith causes God's grace to bring salvation to our lives. We see that the, in the New Testament uh, era, uh, when Jesus was on the earth, those of the Jewish faith, they tried to prove their salvation by association. You know, when Jesus was ministering to uh, those that were not quite learned as some of these other, as the rabbis or the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, they would open their ears. You know, they want to understand how they could get a connection to the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees and all these religious people, they always point to look at the temple. We have Moses' law. We've got the law that was handed to Moses at Sinai. You know, they always made their association by uh, the connection they had to the past. You know, they said, we've got the teachings of the prophets. These were signs of their having favor with God. But Jesus began to challenge them with some strong warnings. Paul also confronted them uh, with their hypocrisy. Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul exclaimed that the Jewish nation was at a disadvantage to the, uh, the Gentiles because the Jewish nation had the law that was going to judge them. The Gentiles, they didn't have a law. 
You know, they were totally ignorant of the law. But Paul says, there is no place of ignorance for you because you have the law. And through your disobedience and not wanting to be obedient to the law, you rebel. And, uh, you know, although the Gentiles, they were not as informed about God's requirement of the human race, Paul did conclude that both Jew and Gentile have sinned and they are thereby subject to condemnation and future judgment. The remedy, Paul also began to explain to them, that uh, would be eliminated uh, the sin and they wouldn't have to have the law of Moses to eradicate their sin. But for the law was only made a person aware of his sins. You know, salvation could not come through mere obedience of man's, mankind's past sins, but the elimination of the debt of sin could come only by the grace of God that made it possible because of a lamb that was slain. Jesus Christ became the sacrificial lamb for our sin. Hallelujah. His blood covers our sin, and yet it still flows and covers sins of the lost today. Those that will confess their sin, he is just to forgive them of their sin. We see that Peter also contended that salvation was through Jesus Christ and not through the work of the law. Uh, Jesus, Paul, and uh, Peter did not suggest that the righteous command of the law should be forsaken, but rather they asserted that the mere obedience of the law of God still could not bring salvation. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You know, uh, how can one who has sinned ever be justified before God? Are not sin stains irreversible like a permanent marker? I know that human blood, animal blood, it stains white and you can't get it out. Uh, I don't care how much ice and cold water and how much OxyClean or uh, bleach. You know, from a distance, you may not see it. It's like, wow, how'd you get that blood stain out of there? But then when you get up close to the, especially when it's white material, there's still that trace of outline of where once where some blood was. And it's like, oh, but I'm so glad to know that the blood of Christ, it takes away all the black spots of sin. Right. It covers. Oh, thank oh hallelujah. Thank you, and uh, we see that in the Old Testament, there were seven major Jewish festivals or feasts and three of those seven was required of all males to attend. Those three feasts that was required attendance for all males was the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, all three of these feasts were precursors of the New Testament salvation plan. Essential to the Passover feast was the lamb that was slain and eaten. As the Jewish participants uh, ate the meal, they reflected on the death angel sparing or passing over the Israelites and not affecting not even their firstborn of the, of the family or the firstborn of the animals. They remembered every year Passover. And for years and years and centuries, 
even today, 2012, during around the first part of April this year, the Jewish uh, community observed the Feast of Passover. It's been 2,000 years since the select Passover lamb died once and for all, for all sin, and yet the Jewish community still observes a heritage where God in His grace and the blood that was applied to the doorpost, the death angel did not attack their family. John the Baptist later prepared the way for this event to be associated with the plan of mankind's salvation redemption as he proclaimed Jesus in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is not a coincidence that Jesus was crucified at the time of Passover. Uh, he was the spotless, the sinless Lamb of God, ordained to pay for mankind's debt of sin. The Feast of Tabernacles reminded the Israelites that God did not forget them during their wanderings in the wilderness for 40 long years. That God was there with them. And God did prove to them that because of their rebellion, they were not allowed to go into the promised land, but he still was there with them because there was a covenant between him and Moses. Because Moses said, if you're not going to go with us, I'm not going either. And he said, for your sake, I'll go. I'll be with you. What a wonderful promise. And we see uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles that the attendees of the feast performed a ritual where they begin to wave palm branches before the Lord. You, this is a uh, one of those excited moments of you know people talk about Pentecostal uh, worship being a lot of hype, you know, getting you know, a lot of emotionalism. But I'll tell you what, when you study and get into the Feast of Tabernacles, that was an emotional worship. There was a lot of uh, singing. There was a lot of rejoicing. There was dancing. There was a celebration that took place. We see that in Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, we see one of the first recorded words of Hosanna. Which, me, which is translated, please save us. Hosanna, please save us. And it is significant that this is what the people cried out to Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem, into the city of Jerusalem on the donkey. And they began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Where they say, please save us. The one that's coming in the name of the Lord, please save us. During the, the feast, the priest performed a unique ritual where they would draw water from the pool of Shiloh or Shalom. And, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, Siloam. And carried it uh, ceremoniously to the temple. The observer of this joyous uh, celebration quoted uh, Isaiah. The Feast of the Tabernacle was considered to be some of the most joyous of all of the Jewish celebrations. Uh, the Feast of Pentecost, it was celebrated 50 days after the feast of uh, Passover feast. And it was coinciding with the time when Moses had received the law on Mount Sinai. It was at that also at the time of the grain harvest. Uh, this feast is spiritually significant because both the law of Moses and the food are synonymous in the life sustaining process. 
Food sustained physical life. The word of God sustained spiritual life. Oh, hallelujah. We see what a wonderful uh, word that we have where it talks about Jesus being the bread of life. Bread, we think of sustaining life. Even though Jesus said to Satan when he said, turn these stones into bread, man should not live by bread alone, but by what? <coughs> Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You're talking about a spiritual bread over physical bread. The new birth message is consistent with all three major Old Testament feasts. Uh, the death of the uh, Lamb of God occurred at Passover feast. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost came at the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, the baptism and the fullness of the prophecy regarding the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, the death of Christ was not a random act of God, but it was a perfectly well thought out plan of redemption. And yet everything came together as God planned. It was simple, yet but a beautiful plan uh, whereby the sinless God incarnate would die. His grace, His grace alone would recompense our debt. Hallelujah. Though we all have said, we all fall short of the glory of God, and yet we can all be justified. Oh, hallelujah. Justification means just as it never happened, as it never existed. Oh, how can you be a God so great could love someone like me? Hallelujah. And yet, when we stand before his eyes, we can be declared righteous. How can that be? How can, because he doesn't see us as we were, but now he sees us as we are. Being justified. He sees his suffering, the death, as a significance to pay our debt of sin. You know, Paul proclaimed in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. You know, there was no human way mankind could ever uh, reverse the condemnation. You know, there wasn't enough uh, bulls and goats and lambs, uh, turtle doves. There wasn't enough grain offerings that could be presented as a sin offering for man's sin. There, was, there couldn't be enough sacrifices made for mankind's sin. And yet, only an act of God could redeem us from the curse of sin, which was the death of condemnation. Just as it was written of the law, and the strength of, was, was the strength of sin. God's word is the strength of our grace. As sin requires death, the gift of God through grace to mankind provides eternal life. And you know, this is the doctrine of grace. Grace has power to reign in our lives and to give us eternal life. Uh, Paul referred to his personal experiences as the example of sufficient uh, grace of God. Anyone can receive God's grace of salvation. They can minister to others through the gift of the Spirit. Uh, because of the zealous, persecuted church, Paul was the least likely candidate for salvation. But because of grace, covered Paul's grievous sins as well. You know, a lot of times we would like to make that selection, well, this one would be a good candidate. This guy would. She would make it a wonderful candidate. She would. When you think about Paul's likelihood to be 
a candidate. No wonder Elias or uh, Ananias said, are, you ta are we talking about the same Saul? The one that has been, is known as a persecutor of the church? No way. <laughs> there is no way that he's made a change. There's got to be something up his sleeve. He's wanting to break in and get on the inside and attack the church. He's already been attacking the church from the outside. Now he's wanting to get in. But aren't you glad for the grace of God who assured Ananias, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me give you a sign. Ananias, if you want a sign, here's a sign. He prayed. <laughs> if he was on the outside trying to break in, he wouldn't be in there praying. But there's been a change in his heart. This is a sign for you, Ananias. Oh, yes. He prayeth. Bless the Lord. It is God's grace that saves us afterward and teaches and enables us to live holy lives. Peter taught that the grace of God was in part salvation to us. It's the meaning of uh, maintaining the holy life. Ten times in his epistle, he uses the word grace and concludes his second epistle, 2 Peter chapter 3, 18, uh, with these words. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Grace is perhaps the first energy that comes to us from God. And it brings us into a measure of faith whereby we can respond to God. Paul admonished Timothy that he should discover strength in the grace of Jesus Christ. You see, at our very, uh, very best, our personal strength is insignificant to please God. Uh, we must rely on the grace of Jesus Christ to enable us to overcome sin, discouragement, and the persecution that comes uh, to us from this world and Satan. Peter encouraged the believers to walk according to the lifestyle that Jesus could exemplify. Uh, he explained that a believer's sufficient strength would come through Grace. We have the power through grace that we can look for to the resurrection. See, not only is grace the first experience that we have in God, but grace should continue until the end. Uh, Peter declared in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now that's a tension getter. Gird up the loins. Because loins, they would think, okay, the breeches, you know, their, their pants, you know, pulling up their skirts. You know. He says, wait a minute. The loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace of that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the revelation of Jesus Christ? See, just as we rely on God's grace to keep us while we are in this world, the same grace that we rely on is going to take us out of this world. Hallelujah. It's His grace in which we're going to be raptured from this world. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Yes. I'm getting ready for those gates of pearl, getting my record right, watching both day and night. I'm getting ready to leave this yes. world. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for the grace of God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. That day is coming. Hallelujah. That day is coming. Hallelujah. And are you ready? That, that is the question. We need to be always ready, always alert. Be on guard. 
Hallelujah. Thank God for his grace. Let's just stand tonight and let's lift our hands and let's just love the Lord for his marvelous grace. The grace that reaches fallen man. The grace of God. Hallelujah. That can lift man out of the sin's despair. your power, great is your strength, great are you Lord and greatly to be praised, great are your ways. great are your works, great are you Lord in all the earth, great is your power, great is your, power. Great is your strength, great is your strength. 